everyone and welcome back to another World of Warcraft video. Today we have a bunch of Q&A, actually both for Battle for Azeroth and Classic. And you know what? The quality of the questions and answers were pretty damn great. So let's get right into it with the big thing that happened. So somebody came up to ask a question, just that it turned out that somebody was Chris Metzen, of course, big guy at Blizzard and also voice actor of Thrall, who basically retired. Um, a few years ago, of course, Thrall was actually teased for Battle for Azeroth, but, well, Battle for Azeroth happened and there was no Thrall. The original story seemed to be that Thrall would be, like, traveling around with Vol'jin's urn, but that never really came to pass. Obviously, things ended up being different. So, the question that Chris Metzen had for the World of Warcraft developers was, when will the true Warchief of the Horde come back? Of course, meaning Thrall. And the answer was, you know, fairly jokey, but also fairly interesting. Alex pretty much said, you know, there might just be a job posting for a war chief pretty soon. And uh, if there was, they'd give him a call. I'm not saying the return of Thrall is confirmed, but that certainly does seem like the return of Thrall is kind of soft confirmed. At any rate, it seems almost certain that Sylvanas is going to get the boot. Perhaps Sarfang is just a little bit long the tooth for that sort of thing, but I would imagine that Sarfang would indeed support Thrall. So, that was very cool. I'd love to see that character come back to the game, actually. I think that would be really, really cool. Next up, and I suppose in a similar vein, there were questions about choice and player agency. Of course, we got to choose whether we put on the gas mask or not, or used the, um, the plague thrower in the Battle for Orderon. Now in patch 8.1, we are being asked if we get to side um, with Sarfang or with Sylvanas. And what um, Alex Afrasabi said back is essentially, this is a bit of an experiment. They haven't really done much player agency before in terms of decision making for the narrative. Right now, it's an experiment. They don't want to go too deep and just do it everywhere in the game. They only want to do it for big moments where it matters. And they want to make sure that there are repercussions and that it goes somewhere. Pretty much, he seems to be saying that your choice in 8.1 is really going to matter. It seems like that is their plan. Of course, that is the choice in 8.1 that you make between Sarfang and Sylvanas. I think that's really cool, and there is great storytelling potential, especially in terms of how the community decides to um, well, align themselves and choose different options. So that's pretty great. Next, we had a question from Reckles from Want to Buy Gold, which is a gold-making YouTube channel. Basically, he asked them what their thoughts were on the 20% auction house cut. It has had some benefits, but there have also been problems in terms of gold making. And essentially, Ian said that this is a band-aid fix to try to sort of fix up the AH problem right now, but Ian pretty much said, the auction house right now is a hot mess. They need a foundational rework of how it operates, and he said that is actively being worked on right now, and that in fact, one of the limiting factors on how big a server can go is the auction house crumbling, so they really do want to get that problem fixed, and I am all for a new revamped auction house. I think that would be a pretty fantastic thing for the game. Next, we have a very interesting question. Sylvanas versus Garrosh. What is the difference? Well, Alex did say, look, he, he can't exactly say how the story is going to go, but he did say one extremely important thing, that if he was Sylvanas, that he'd be looking back at Garrosh and thinking, what an amateur. Now, <laughs> that, um, that's definitely a spicy answer. It does sort of indicate that Sylvanas is doing something maybe a little bit nasty or whatever, but I suppose when we think about it, Garrosh did want to, you know, have the whole planet under one glorious strong banner. And, you know, technically Garrosh, not the biggest fan of the Burning Legion. So, you know, it could be that Sylvanas is trying to do something evil, but for the right reasons. Of course, even Arthas as the Lich King, kind of, it's said in Chronicle, pretty much knew about all of these external threats and that it would be ideal if the planet was just all undead, resistant to these various threats, and unified and powerful. So it seems like Sylvanas could be going down that kind of path, but we will have to see for, you know, later for, for how that goes. Of course, there is the big tease that I talked about recently uh, regarding Sylvanas and that weapon that she seems to be wielding in patch 8.2. Next, I was questioning about classic and live in any crossover, and the answer is really a solid no. There will not be any crossover of rewards or unlocks or sort of cross promotions between classic and live. So it's not like you're going to do something in classic and get a battle pet as a reward in live. And you know what? I think that absolutely is the right way for it to be. I don't think those um, games should really be too cross-promoting each other. Next up, we had a question about Class Relics. Now, if you don't remember, back in Warlords of Draenor, they released a blog post that was essentially showing these, like, customizable things for your class, like maybe having a, you know, a holy book being, you know, slinging off your, um, off your belt. 
And Chris Robinson pretty much said, yeah, I, I really posted that blog a bit too early. Basically, that being a game-wide system isn't really something that's panning out. They have infused parts of it into, say, the artifact system, and a big part of the problem is tech annoyances. Now, I can empathize with that because in our game that we're working on, we are trying to make a compositional rigging system that's open to player customization. And you know what? It's really hard. <laughs> it's a big challenge, so I can ap absolutely empathize with the team. Though he did say that the learnings from the class relics are being worked into things like, say, heritage armor. Now, there was another really good question for Chris, and that was about tinting armor. And he actually gave a fantastic, um, a fantastic response. So, basically, one of the reasons why you can't really tint the WoW armor and have it work well is because of how the WoW armor is constructed from a texturing perspective. You look at WoW armor, there's a lot of depth in, well, a pretty, you know, like a flat texture. And it's not like they're using very complex geometry for their armor sets. And a lot of that is because of the way that they paint things. So, you know, say the color purple won't just be the color purple. It'll be a bunch of other colors layered up to give depth to the armor. And that's what makes so much of the WoW textures look so good. The problem is that when you just do tinting, it doesn't really preserve that. And in the past, he said that they actually tried this with Burning Crusade, where they would make the armor in grayscale and then apply a tint to it. That's pretty much what led to the clown gear, and it hasn't really worked out that well, and they've tried it since. So it doesn't seem like we're going to be getting that tinting. However, he did say that it is something that they could probably do in a future bit of armor. So as an example, if you had a new version of artifacts, they could probably construct them with a tinting system in mind, such as that could be done. Now, this is not a hard um, you know, confirmation of anything. It's just him talking about the way that it could be done. I would really like to see tinting in the game, but I absolutely do understand um, you know, his, his point, and that if every bit of armor had to be done with the tinting in mind, you know what, we probably would get bits of armor that don't really look as good as they do now. And thinking about a game like Star Wars The Old Republic, yes, it is really cool that you can tint your armor, but also look at the texture work on that armor. Suffice to say, it's, um, you know, the, the quality of the painting, or, you know, just the art style, I suppose. It works for that art style. It doesn't really work for the, the WoW art style and the way that it's done. Okay, let's move on to some more gameplay stuff. So, on the topic of leveling and character progression, they pretty much said that they're not happy with how level progression feels. And, of course, one of the great things about, say, Classic is every level you get a talent point, whereas right now you don't really get that. You don't get new abilities. In fact, you kind of lose stuff. Basically, Ian said that they really think this is a problem. They don't have a solution, but it is something that they're very much actively uh, worried about and discussing internally. He said that, as an example, a leveling squish might feel weird. They don't really know if that could work, but it is a problem that they see. Next, there was, a, of course, a question about RNG and why so much of it. And uh, there was many cheers in the crowd. And really, we got the same response that we always get about the upsides of deterministic gear, the downsides of it, the upsides of RNG, and the downsides of it. And pretty much Ian said that, well, I mean, the quote is, we've perhaps swung a bit too far. So that is something that's reflected in patch 8.1, Tides of Vengeance, where we do see some currencies and some vendors. It seems like they're maybe navigating back into a more healthy path with that one, but we will just need to wait and see what their actions are. Next, on the topic of Azerite gear, we actually got a really good answer. So Ian basically said that, you know, right now they get there's not enough choice and there's a bunch of issues. He said that um, Tides of Vengeance is going to, you know, have more options in the outer ring because we'll choose between two for each spec, and that certainly is good. He then said that it is something we'll be building on over time, including adding a little bit more depth to the heart of Azeroth. Now, we do know that we're questing with Magni in patch 8.2, so perhaps that's where that will um, appear, or maybe that's something that will come in the, um, probably the Nazoth patch of 8.3. Sadly, there was no mention of reforging, which to me is quite a big concern, but um, yeah, we'll just need to move on for now. Two global cooldowns. There were more cheers in the crowd with this one. So basically, Ian talked about the experiment that they did on beta, the problems that they, you know, they had, the things that they sort of went back on. He said that, of course, for protection, warriors ignore pain is going to be coming off the global cooldown in patch 8.1, but that overall, while they are happy with the offensive buffs being in the global cooldown, the largest problem that they see is movement and utility. Now, the problem isn't really that, you know, using a movement ability and incurring the 0.5 second GCD is a problem. The problem is that maybe you just use an ability and then you immediately have to react to something. And it doesn't really feel good if you invoke the global cooldown, but then that means you can't charge or you can't heroic leap. So that is something that they are going to be reverting in patch 8.1 Tides of Vengeance. Once again, more cheers from the crowd. I think that's definitely a good thing. They, yeah, they perhaps did go, uh, well, a good bit too far with them um, with that one. 
Next, somebody asked about essentially just niche uh, abilities and um, homogenization and that sort of thing. Essentially just asking, can we get closer to Mists of Pandaria? Now, Ian basically said that he thinks that some of the more niche abilities um, can be really cool, the ones that like don't compete with rotational abilities, so they're not really against those. But the concern is that, say, with the Mist talents, they're just ended up being a situation where the talents were repeatedly shoring up weaknesses in a spec rather than doubling down on the strengths of a spec. And Ian basically said that they'd rather focus on the strengths of a spec. Basically, it's going to a slightly older era of design where instead of you know, say, in Mist, where everyone can do everything and everyone is super powerful, they want people to be more or less powerful in different aspects of the game. The thought is that that equals more mechanical teamwork, and if you think back to Vanilla and TBC, yeah, the classes were not well-rounded at all, and I think much of the gameplay that people loved was, you know, creating a comp, working around it, and the sort of teamwork that came out of that. I think one of the problems is that right now, the game is, well, the player base is more um, mechanically, I don't want to say aware, but, you know, there's more simming, there's more stuff like that. Everyone's trying to work out the perfect response to every possible situation, which I think does make a type of design like that, a more old school one, perhaps function a little bit um, less effectively than it did in the past. And that is, I think that's absolutely a, a big challenge for the team to overcome. And I guess some sort of line they're going to have to walk. Next up, we actually have a little bit of classic stuff. So they were sharding on the classic demo. And basically Ian said that the demo is a special case because everyone is funneled into two zones. So sharding lets the BlizzCon demo run. He also said that, well, the WoW Classic um, launch poses challenges, and their plan is that for the first few weeks, they think they can use sharding to solve initial launch problems. But then once server population solidify, they want to remove the sharding because they know that, you know, there must be one Kazakh per server. That's important in, like, the loot economy. Mining veins for, say, Thorium, they should be competed over because they're a limited resource in the game world. So they know those things are important, they absolutely think that's a part of the authentic, like, classic experience. So it seems like they're going to be using sharding to avoid some launch gripes and launch problems, but then once they can get rid of it, that's what they want to do. And you know what? I think that is actually a pretty, um, pretty fair way to go for it. And in another fan favorite question, they were asked about transmog restrictions, and we have yet another very positive patch 8.1 bit of news, and that is that you will be able to transmog over fist weapons. I main a monk. And that means that I'm pretty damn happy about this one. So yeah, overall, that's that's very good. They did mention ones. They know people want that, but there are um, some more technical hurdles with the animation sets and how that stuff all actually functions with ones that are kind of preventing that from being a thing right now. But yeah, they're freeing up um, that restriction for now. Perhaps they will move on to others in the future. Then a quick lore bit. Um, somebody asked basically, will we see more of Gallywix? And Afrasabi essentially said, look, I'm not going to tell you what the future story is right now, but he did say one thing. We're going to fire that cannon. You might be wondering what cannon. Uh, the big, like, zone-sized cannon in Ashara. Now, I actually did a video on that. Um, well, I did a video on the size of Azeroth. It's got some fun maths about that cannon and um, a famous German plan for... Uh, I guess, German cannon from uh, World War II. So that could be kind of interesting to you. But yeah, we're going to fire Gallywix's big cannon. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure he'll really feel um, well compensated for once that happens. Next, of course, the lost specs of WoW, which is what I've called this um, this point. Like, say, you know, the shamans, the shadow priests, etc. Basically, Ian said they know they really need to take action on this one. They know it's a big problem. To the point where Ian on stage joked about or not joke but like he referenced the community memes of people being either on the bench or on suicide watch which is definitely pretty spicy uh, of a thing to be coming up in the uh, you know in the blizzcon uh, q a but yeah suffice to say he said they know that we just need to wait and see what happens on ptr then in another i think fan favorite question they were basically asked what's up with the class themed armor sets and Ian said that they're trying something different for BFA with their raid sets. And I suppose one benefit that we are seeing is, you know, all the raid sets are coming out, but we are getting a lot of other sets, like say the Warfront ones, the Heritage Armor and all of that stuff. But he did say that it's quite likely the class armor is something that will return in the future. And there you go, that is pretty much it for the BlizzCon WoW Q&A. Now, of course, many fan sites and outlets do have Q&As booked with developers the transcripts, you know, they'll all be released over the coming days. Overall, though, there was actually great information in this. It's, yeah, I was really surprised. Normally, the BlizzCon Q&A for World of Warcraft is, you know, it's it's the subject of jokes. It gets memed on all the time. But this one was actually, you know, full of really interesting things. We got some new pretty cool tidbits about patch 8.1, and Afrasabi, uh, Alex Afrasabi, did a 
great job of giving us some spicy little teases for the future lore of the game. So let me know what you thought about these down in the comments below. Let me know what you think about the direction of WoW in general. I kind of want to, you know, feel the temperature of things uh, now that BlizzCon is essentially wrapped. But with that, guys, thank you very much for watching this video, and I will see you next time.